two, three, and. Weapon may be four. No weapon may be four, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it will prevail. Because the God I serve knows only how to triumph. And my God will never fail. No, my God will never fail. I'm going to see. I'm going to see. Blessed be your name. 
Everybody, thank you for your time today. I'm glad that we could spend these next few moments together. Uh, we are continuing in our discussion of Mark chapter 10. Uh, and I will say this is going to be a tough one today. Um, this is going to be a tough discussion. It's dealing with some very personal and difficult topics. And to kind of lighten the mood a little bit before we get into these tougher topics. Um, I have a story. A young couple, uh, like many young couples, had decided to wed after a time of dating. And as the big day approached, they grow, both kind of grew getting apprehensive. Uh, you see, each of them had a problem that they had struggled with for many years that they had not yet shared with one another. Uh, the gro the groom-to-be, he was overcome by fear and decided to ask his father for some advice. He said, Dad, I am deeply concerned about the success of my marriage. Uh, I love my fiancé dearly, but I have very smelly feet, and I'm afraid that she will be put off by the smell of my feet. No problem, his dad says. All you have to do is wash your feet as often as possible and always wear socks, even to bed. Well, this seemed like a, a workable solution. It sounded easy enough. And then the bride-to-be also kind of overcome with fear. 
decided to take her problem to her mother. Mom, she said, when I wake up in the morning, my breath is truly awful. Honey, everybody has bad breath in the morning, her mom said. No, no, no. You don't understand. My morning breath is so bad, I'm afraid that my new husband will not want to sleep in the same room with me. Her mother explained, well, in the morning, just get straight out of bed and head to the bathroom and brush your teeth. The key is to not say a word until you have brushed your teeth. Not a word, her mother affirmed. Well, she thought that that was easy enough and worth a try. So the young couple, they were finally married. It was a beautiful ceremony. And then they didn't forget the advice that they had both received. Uh, him with his perpetual sock wearing and her with her morning silence. They managed pretty well for a while. But then about six months later, shortly before dawn, the husband woke to find that one of his socks had come off. Fearful of the consequences, he frantically searched the bed with his feet. He even stuck his head underneath the covers looking for that lost sock so he could put it on. And this, of course, woke up his new bride, who, without thinking, immediately asked, What on earth are you doing, babe? Oh no, he gasped. You've swallowed my sock. This story is obviously ridiculous. But had this, had this situation happened in ancient Israel, this simple issue would have been reason enough for the husband to ask for a divorce. And we laugh, but this was a serious issue and one of great debate among religious leaders in Jesus' day. So in our passage this, uh, today, we will see them use this very hot button issue to test Jesus. They wanted to see if they could turn the crowd against him and hopefully find enough reason to have him put to death. So we're going to be looking into this story today, but for now, let's have the praise team continue leading us in worship. Today's scripture comes from Psalm 139, 1 through 6. O oh Lord, you have examined my heart and know everything about me. You know when I sit down or stand up. You know my thoughts, even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel, when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I'm going to say even before I say it, Lord. You go before me. You follow me. You place your hand of blessings upon my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too great for me to understand. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. The sun comes up. The sun comes up. It's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be seen. in love.
Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before. Oh my soul, I worship your holy name. And on that day. Hello again. Thank you uh, if you're just now tuning in for joining us. We're continuing in our discussion, uh, the Gospel of Mark. We're going to be in chapter 10 today. Um, you know, one of the difficult parts of this kind of study, where we're working straight through an entire book or an entire letter in the Bible, is that you can't practice um, pogo stick or kangaroo theology. In other words, you can't just hop around from text to text, picking and choosing the passages that you want to talk about. Uh, when you're digging in, like we have been over the past eight months now, the only way to do it right is to just kind of walk right through it. And today, it's one of those passages, if I'm being really honest, that I would just like to skip over. Uh, I don't want to talk about divorce, but that is the uncomfortable topic that we are going to be looking at today. But I don't want to talk about it for a number of reasons. But it is a topic that Jesus did have a lot to say about. Uh, so in doing this, I don't want to talk about it in a normal way. I want to try and find what are the overarching principles that are behind what Jesus is saying. Not that a discussion about marriage and divorce isn't important, but I think there's something bigger that's going on behind the text that I really want us to focus on. I want us to focus more on the heart today than the physical things that are being brought up. But first, let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity that we have. I thank you for allowing us to uh, come together in this virtual space to have a very real discussion about uh, a difficult topic. And God, I hope that uh, what is heard today are your words, uh, words of love and hope and guidance. And God, I pray that we are able to find these timeless truths that will ultimately affect our lives and our marriages. It's uh, in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So we're going to be, like I said, in the 10th chapter, in the 10th chapter of Mark. Jesus is back on the road. He's with his disciples they are leaving the region of Galilee for the last time. Uh, verse 1 of chapter 10 says, And he left there and went to the region of Judea, 
beyond the Jordan, and the crowds gathered to him again. And again, as his custom was, he taught them. So this verse is kind of a, a summary verse uh, of a rather extensive time of ministry in Jesus' life, uh, the time that he had after he left Galilee. This, uh, this travel, this journey, it took him through Samaria, where in other gospel accounts we have some valuable teaching that happens, and it takes him into northern Judea. During this time, he has sent out the 70 disciples, just as his, he had earlier sent out the 12 to go into all these villages and preach the gospels and to cast out demons and heal people. Also, as John tells us in his 10th chapter, is during this period that he made a quick trip to Jerusalem uh, in the middle of winter, and he spoke during the Feast of Dedication. Uh, after this, he left Jerusalem, and he came with his disciples at where we are now into the area on the eastern side of the Jordan River, uh, AKA, a.k.a. beyond the Jordan, and he's here in a region that's called Perea. Uh, this is where he is now ministering. And we're told that the crowds gathered to him, and again, as his custom was, he taught them. So during this time, he had made, during this time of teaching, he had made some religious leaders upset. So Mark goes on to tell us some Pharisees, these upset religious leaders, came to him, and in order to test him, they asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife. Now Mark is careful to point out that the, the motive which Jesus, which brought these people to Jesus was not because they wanted to learn from him. They didn't really care what his thoughts were about divorce. The Greek word used here to suggest that they were probing him, that they were jabbing him verbally, and they were trying to stir up trouble. They were trying to catch him saying something that would provoke controversy, that would draw the crowds uh, away from him, that they would create hostility against him. And that's what they wanted to happen. They wanted this to intensify drastically because by this point, they had already determined that Jesus had to go. These religious leaders all through the area had already decided that it was time for Jesus to die. So they selected a very controversial question, one which was bound to draw considerable interest on the part of the people, um, but also a lot of criticism. And it's this touchy issue of divorce. Um, it is evident that they are trying to get him to make a choice between one of two prevailing schools of thought amongst the Jews. Because whichever one he chose would say a lot about who he was. Uh, one of these teachings was from the Rabbi Hillel, uh, he explained, the Rabbi Hillel, that in Deuteronomy 24, Moses said that a man could divorce his wife if he found any indecency in her. Hillel interpreted that any pearl heart, that little, that little tiny word, he interpreted that to mean anything which displeased the husband. If his, if his wife made bad coffee, he could divorce her. If she did not keep the house clean enough, he could divorce her. If she got a little angry or argumentative, he could divorce her. Whatever, whatever displeased the husband was, in Rabbi Hillel's eye, grounds for divorce. This was the easy school of divorce in the day. Opposed to that thought was the school of Rabbi Shammai, who taught that divorce was to be strictly limited, that only under certain rigidly defined conditions could divorce ever be granted. Those rigidly divine, defined uh, things were unfaithfulness in marriage, if the wife was barren, or if she began to worship foreign gods. These, under the teaching Rabbi Shammai, were the only grounds for legal divorce. So these religious leaders in Jesus' day, um, they were split, and the people were split between these two schools of thought. So the question is, what do we do about divorce? 
Is divorce something to be insignificant, something to be taken lightly, something to be taken for granted because of incompatibility alone, or is divorce something serious, something to be sought only extremely limited conditions? This is the issue that Jesus is being confronted with by these religious leaders, and they know that this is a subject of high, hot debate. And in Jesus' answer, he develops two very important arguments. Jesus takes those listening back to the original teaching of Moses on divorce, um, but then he goes back even further to the time of creation. So let's look at the first one of those. Let's look first at what Jesus says about Moses' teaching in the law. He answered them, this is from Mark 10, 3 through 5. He answered them, what does the law of Moses say about this? They answered, Moses allows a man to write out divorce papers and send his wife away. Jesus replied, Moses gave you this law because you are so heartless. Notice that Jesus does not simply answer the Pharisees immediately out of his own authority. First, he sends him all the way back to Moses, all the way back to the law. In other words, he upheld the authority of God's word just as he always did. In the Sermon on the Mountain, Jesus said that he came not to destroy the law, but to fill it, and then warned against anyone who attempted to destroy the law or change what it said. This is why he sent these Pharisees back to Moses for the answer. But he didn't stop there. He went on to clarify. He went on, he is helping them understand what Moses' words really meant and is revealing something that the law itself doesn't tell us. He's giving us the motive. He's giving us the reason why Moses permitted divorce according to this Mosaic law. And this is very significant, and it's very insightful. It's something that the people had not ever fully understand. Jesus goes behind what is written in Deuteronomy 24 and says, Moses gave you this law because you are so heartless. It was because of the coldness, it was because of the hardness of the people's heart that Moses allowed divorce to happen. So what does that mean? Well, it is pointed out very clearly that a divorce could occur. There's, they're not arguing about that. A divorce could occur. In essence, issuing divorce papers reveals, though, in a very public way, what had already been going on in the private parts of that marriage. Divorce was permitted, according to Jesus, only to show the hardness of someone's heart to not make the marriage work. But this is what law always does. The law was given to reveal sin. Paul talks about that in Romans. Romans chapter 3, verse 20. He says, all the law does is point out our sin. And what was going on with Israel with regards to voice was evidently a hardness of heart. That's all that the law regarding divorce was revealing, is that there was a hardness of heart. So what exactly is a hardened heart? Well, what's the opposite? Well, the opposite of hardened would be a softened heart. Uh, a softened heart is gentle, it's open, it's flexible, it's malleable. Unfortunately, there's not very many uh, occurrences of a soft heart in the Bible, but there are many occurrences of this phrase, hardness of heart. And we're warned again and again about, war about hardening our hearts. There's a story uh, back in the Old Testament of when Moses was sent to Pharaoh, uh, and he told Pharaoh this important message that was from God. He said, let my people go. And when Pharaoh heard that word, he, it's, we're told that Pharaoh hardened his heart. But what did that mean? It meant that Pharaoh had determined that he was going to handle things his way. He determined to respond to the natural inclination of his flesh. He chose to do what he felt like doing in the situation. 
to handle it himself and to ultimately ignore what God was saying. This is what the hardening of a heart looks like. It's when you determine that you are going to handle something the way that you want to handle it. And when you have decided not to pay attention to what God is trying to tell you, not to pay attention to what God is revealing to you. And this is what was going on with many marriages in Israel. So you can see why, according to Moses, if a husband, unfortunately, this is a patriarchal society, it only looked at it from the standpoint of the husband. So you can see why, according to Moses, if a husband could see some indecency in his wife, he could divorce her. He did not specify what that indecency was. Evidently, it was just something that was displeasing to the husband, something in his wife that he just didn't like. And Moses said that because of this husband's hardness of heart, a divorce was to be permitted to reveal this, hu this husband's attitude. Now, what would this reveal about the husband's attitude? Well, what attitude... It reveals what attitude we all have if we're offended by someone else, right? When we find something offensive in someone, we object to it. We protest it. We criticize it. We put it down. We disparage it in some way. And we even reject the person because of it. This is what was going on in these marriages. The husbands were treating their wives with such contempt because of something that they found in them that they simply didn't like. But this is not how it was meant to be. So what should we do? What should a spouse do when they find something in their mate that they just don't like? That's a tough question, right? Well, according to the New Testament, we ought to understand why our husband or our wife is like this. Peter encourage us, encourages us to dwell with your wives according to knowledge. That is, don't merely react to them. Try to understand why they are acting the way they're acting. Live with them according to knowledge. Give them affection. Honor them. Share yourself with them. Do your best to understand them. Restore them. And ultimately, what all this boils down to, ultimately love them. This is what we ought to do. This is what marriage is for. But, unfortunately, we often fail there. So Moses granted divorce, according to Jesus, in order to make it clear that a hardness of heart is what was happening in this marriage. So what does softening of a heart look like? Well, a heart is softened when it recognizes uh, its inability to handle a situation and relies on the wisdom and the power of God. This, that very thing is what keeps a heart tender, Relying on God is what keeps a heart mellow and malleable. Relying on God's wisdom is what keeps us reasonable. Having a soft heart is recognizing that we don't have what it takes. And because of that recognition, we have a reliance upon the wisdom and the love of God. That we have an obedience to Him. And this, this obedience, this reliance... This love of God is what keeps our hearts soft and tender. This is what should have been happening in all of these marriages. But instead, marriages in Jesus' day were only getting worse and worse. Women were being downgraded. They were being degraded. They were being mistreated. They were being treated with contempt and cruelty and harshness. So I believe in order to make it clear and visible, Moses granted permission for divorce. And God allowed that to happen because God wanted to reveal the sinfulness of having a cold heart. Because remember, that's all the law ever does. It reveals what's wrong. It reveals the sinfulness in a situation. 
And there was sinfulness in how these husbands were treating their wives. It was sinful to have this kind of coldness, this kind of hard-heartedness towards their wives. But Jesus doesn't stop there. Now he goes on to show us a far deeper and a more important matter. Um, He puts his finger on the reason why so many marriages then and now fail. It's because of this hardness of heart, but it goes even deeper that Jesus now explains that the cure for broken marriages is found in the original creative design, the creative design for marriage. Let's read that passage, Mark 10, verse 6 through 9. But in the beginning, God made a man and a woman. That's why a man leaves his father and mother and gets married. He becomes like one person with his wife. Then they are no longer two people but one. And no one should separate a couple that God has joined together. I'm sure you recognize those words. They are quoted at almost every wedding ceremony that you go to. And yet, they are often disregarded almost immediately afterwards. Jesus is revealing a teaching about marriage that most people have forgotten and totally disregarded. His teaching goes far beyond that of the Pharisees. His teaching goes far beyond that of Moses and the law, beyond the whole Hebrew economy. He takes us right back to the dawn of creation, to the very beginning of the human race. And Jesus points out to us that what happened with Moses and the law was not the crucial factor here. The law came in only to show us that a problem existed. The real issue, the real question is not how to get a divorce or what constitutes grounds for divorce. The real question is why should we maintain a marriage? Because this relationship, this marriage relationship is the most human the most important human relationship we can have in this life. According to God, our marriage is meant to take priority over all others. The most important human relationship we have is the marriage relationship. It takes priority over the relationship we have with our parents, the relationship we have with our siblings. God explains a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. This may sound a little odd, But the marriage relationship is even meant to be closer than the one that we have with our own children. And of course, this marriage relationship must, must come before all friendships and all other outside relationships. This is what God had in mind when he created us all those eons ago. So what then is the purpose of a marriage? Well, according to God... In this creative design, and according to Jesus here in Mark, it is where two become one. This is what makes a marriage successful. This is what marriages are for. for. It's what they're all about. Two people, two desperate, two distinct, two very different individuals, two people with different personalities, with different gifts. In marriage, all those things now come together. They are blended together, create this new creation. These two very different people now become one. This is what marriage is. Now it does, it's not something that happens instantaneously. It's not something that happens overnight. The wedding service itself doesn't make you one with your spouse. The first time you have sex doesn't make you one with your spouse. It begins the process, but they don't finish it. It takes the whole marriage to accomplish this oneness. Marriage is the process of two people becoming one. But it is in allowing this oneness to happen that so many marriages fail. Because a lot of times, we don't do the work of oneness. Marriages 
fail oftentimes because we see each other as roommates. But marriage is not about living together and then going your separate ways. It's not about having separate careers. It's, it's not about merely sharing a house and a bed together. Marriage is about choosing to be together no matter what and choosing to spend the rest of your lives together. This is how two become one. This is how two lives are merged together. It is choosing every single day that I love Brianna more than any problem, more than any difference that comes between us. Now, a successful marriage is not one without problems because there's going to be problems. I promise you that. But it is one where the problems are being worked out, where we face and admit to our own shortcomings, to our own deficiencies, where we do the hard work to change. And I do this, why? I do this because I love Brianna more than my own pridefulness. And because I love Brianna, I have to discover the hardness of my heart that I might be fostering somewhere. And then I have to allow God to soften it through obedience and love and wisdom. But let's keep going with Jesus' teaching. See, not, I mean, all marriages, they're created equal, but not all divorces. Uh, let's look at Mark 10 again. Later, when he was alone with his disciples in the house, they brought up the subject again. He told them, whoever divorces his wife and marries someone else commits adultery against her. And if a woman divorces her husband and marries someone else, she commits adultery. Now, no one ever said that the teachings of Jesus were easy to hear, right? Sometimes they're downright hard. And in this text, Jesus, he's elevating the matter of divorce far beyond the prevailing view of marriage according to the Jews. But he has to clarify what he's saying to the disciples. And remember, all this is being said in context of the Pharisees' original question. We can't take it out of, out of context from what the original question was. He is saying that within the context of what was written of this idea of a written notice of divorce that was mentioned in Deuteronomy 24, he is saying in the context of these notices of divorce being used for any small reason whatsoever, he is saying that if a person has a heart so hard and so cold to their spouse, if they have refused the process of two becoming one, and if the divorce their spouse because they burnt the food, because they have not picked up their underwear from the floor, because they uh, bought season tickets to uh, the Padres without talking about it, because they bought a bottle of red wine when you ask for a bottle of white, because they don't take showers frequently enough. That if you're getting divorced, and then remarried for petty reasons like this, then you are committing adultery. Where God is concerned, their original marriage is intact because they didn't do the work in the first place. It has not been ripped apart by breach of the marriage covenant through adultery and abandonment and abuse and worship of false gods. Now, I know this has been a hard message to hear, and I do not intend to um, give anybody a sense of condemnation. That's not the purpose. Marriage is God's way of putting two lives together to produce oneness. That will be a testimony to the whole world, a testimony to the grace and power of God in our lives. So allow God to soften your heart. Allow God to Remove the hardness that is holding you back. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this moment that we've had together. And we ask that you allow it to affect us. That you allow it to soften our hearts in a way that we can um, learn what love really is. And help us to treat 
our loved ones with softness and kindness and love. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll see you next time. This is my desire to honor you, Lord, with all my heart, I worship you, oh, all I have within me, I give. This is my desire. This is my desire to honor you, Lord, with all. Lord, have